Hello and welcome to another episode of Come Back Stronger brought to you by the Facing Brooks Law Offices. I'm Dana Brooks and I'm joined today by my law partner, Kimmy Hogan. Hey. Welcome, Kimmy. We've hey. got a great show. One more great show like we always bring to you of a story of somebody who has um, been faced with some significant adversity and found some strength uh, to, to corral around herself and her resources and come back stronger for it and then help other people. This story is, uh, this one's a hard one for me and you because yeah. we're both moms and, um, and you especially, you have little boys, but this is a story of Samantha Isaac and her journey with her um, lovely little son, Jake. Um, I'm sorry, Hank. But um, she, had the misfortune of getting a, a virus. Uh, I think it's called, what is it, CMV, cytomegalovirus. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty common. I mean, really, it's not something that, um, I think something like 75% of people have had it by a certain time, but uh, when you get it during pregnancy, it can cause some uh, pretty serious complications. And I'd never heard anything about this no. virus before until watching this video. No. And so I'm thinking, gosh, I would be so mad, just like, of course, she was, yeah. that there wasn't a screening procedure in place. Yeah, because what's uh, happened here is, unfortunately, the CMV went undetected uh, until the uh, child was born and wasn't meeting certain devel developmental milestones or, or, or screenings were not going as well. Uh, and again, it just tells people how important it is to get those early childhood screenings. Those are available to people. We could talk more later about the resources to make sure th um, that people can, can reach those. But, you know, the screening so you can get earlier intervention and, and here even maybe six months might have made some difference in the outcome. But it's a real, it can have very devastating effects, uh, which Samantha will explain to us uh, when we come back. But what do you think about when you think about screenings and pregnancy and it's supposed to be a joyful time in your life, but, you know. It's such a scary time, too. Yeah. I had complicated pregnancies with yeah. both of mine, and um, just, you know, when you're going into pregnancy, you don't think about that necessarily. Yeah. Yeah, you think um, about the sunshine and the, the, that sm smiling, cute, cooing baby that's going to, um, yeah. you know, just give you all that warmth and love. And uh, Samantha's just such a strong woman. This, is not, this wasn't her first child. It was her fourth child. She has three um, healthy, happy little girls. Uh, and this was their little boy, their, their gift of their son. And unfortunately, the, this disease has pre presented lifelong, you know, problems that he, that he and they are going to have to deal with. But she didn't let that stop her. And she wants to make sure she tries to change the future for other people so they get screened so they're not going to have to deal with this. So I cannot wait to bring her story to you all when we get back because it's really going to, it's going to really motivate you to, to see the good in the world. So we'll be right back after this. I recently had a new client and she suffered a mild traumatic brain injury okay. and she had no idea what had happened that caused her to be injured. Mm. Um, Gotcha. But it turns out she had fallen into a pit at an oil change oh. station. And it was 100% oh, their fault. Oh, wow. But, she, but her injury made her not even understand. Her injury, and it makes, it, me, it makes me so frustrated because mm -hmm. folks that suffer concussions or mild traumatic brain injuries, it's really difficult for them to know to what remember, happened right? and to understand yeah. the difference in what their life was and what it is now yeah. because of the nature of their condition. And so the insurance companies need to recognize the full value of that. Yeah, yeah. instead but of taking advantage of that very unique situation. It took yeah. her family telling her, you need to call an attorney. Right. Mm -hmm. Her family coming with her to the appointment mm -hmm. to say, these are the differences mm -hmm. to get her in there. And now we're able to help her. Mm -hmm. I love that. And we're back. We're going to start now with the first segment of Carrie Roan's interview with Samantha Isaac. And she'll talk to us about her experience and how her son Hank is doing. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you so much for having me. Your name is Samantha Isaacs, yes. and I know that you're an advocate um, for health, for child health, and I want to talk about that, and prenatal health as well. Mm -hmm. how, did, how did that all start, and what are you advocating for? So that started with the birth of my son, Hank, who will be six in May. Um, Hank was born in May of 2015, and perfect textbook pregnancy. Everything was great. Mm -hmm. um, and day one in the hospital we do um, newborn screenings for hearing which is standard testing nothing out of the ordinary and he's your fourth kid right Hank is my fourth so you had yes. been through 
I've done that before. <laughs> right, <yeah>. right, right. <laughs> With nothing new for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, when when the twins were born, we did this all this testing. And when Hank's older sister Emma was born, we did all this testing. And so it wasn't anything that I was concerned about. Mm-hmm. But they come in and they do the newborn hearing, and uh, Hank didn't pass. And so they said, well, it could be he had you had a C-section, so he could have fluid in his ears, and maybe it's just too soon after birth. So they come back a little while later and they try again, and um, he failed again. So they said, well, maybe it's because you were nursing him, or maybe your laptop was too close to the testing machine and it you know, interfered. And so we would try again. So they come back the next day and we try one more time, and and he doesn't pass. And you know they don't want to scare you. The yeah. nurses aren't going to be like, oh no. So they said, well, you'll just need to follow up with your with your pediatrician when you're discharged, and they'll refer you to audiology. And was he a normal baby at that point? For all yeah. intent, yeah, mm-hmm. for what you yep. knew, he was. Ten fingers, ten toes, seven pounds and four ounces. He had a head full of hair, which mm-hmm. explains all the heartburn. And, um, <laughs> just absolutely great. Nothing out of the ordinary that that we knew of. Um, so when when you know when they say your baby failed his hearing test, you you do kind of worry a little bit. But I have three healthy girls. You know why would this be any different? Yeah. So Hank's two weeks old, and we go to audiology, and he, and he fails again, and we go back two weeks later, and he fails again, and. So finally, at four months old, Hank sees um, Dr. Becker, and she says, you know, we're going to need to really find out if he can't hear. So we do an ABR, and he's deaf. So with no family history, now we have to go see a geneticist, Mm -hmm. and we go through that, and Hank's now six months old, and we're starting to see some other things. He he can't sit yet, or he's not rolling, and um, he's doing this weird thing with his legs where they cross over all the time. Just little things that... You don't want to pay too much attention to, but like you're noticing. Yeah. Like I don't remember. A little different. That. Yeah, yeah. It's a little different than his sister's, but every baby's different, right? Mm-hmm. So what does that mean? And um, so we go and we we see our geneticist, and she she seems to know that something's off, just the way that she's taking care of business in the room. And yeah. um, we leave there, and we've got a, a stack full of referrals. We've got to go for all of these tests and see two more doctors and. We, we come back for our follow-up. It's October 21st, and, um, and I think everyone kind of remembers like a diagnosis day. Of course. And, um, and from now on, we celebrate it. We call mm-hmm. it our diagnosis anniversary. Do it's, you really? We do, and we do something fun that day. That's and so interesting. Kind of just, you know, we've made it this far. And you turn what could have potentially yeah. been a bad day into a good day for yeah. everybody. We like, do. Thank we, God we found out. So what was the diagnosis? So the diagnosis was that Hank has congenital CMV, which is an infection um, from a virus called cytomegalovirus that I got during pregnancy Mm -hmm. and didn't know Mm -hmm. and passed it on to him. Were you sick during your pregnancy at all? Not at all. I worked until five days before Hank Mm -hmm. was born, I worked. And so I never missed a day. And you worked in oncology. So you were Mm -hmm. on your feet and you were busy. Yes so busy Mm -hmm. all the time and working with patients and doctors and other nurses and so to to come out on the other side and find out about this you know there's this shock and blow that I didn't know and you live with you you get this guilty feeling you know had I known do they not test for CMV in pregnant women no there are now 13 15 states we just recently had two more pass some legislation um, but it's not routinely tested for. Mm. Um, oftentimes, you don't have any symptoms. It's very mild. Sometimes it's just a small flu-like symptom, and like you might fatigue and fever, but you're tired anyway. You're pregnant, and you know a fever comes and goes with anything. I get a fever when I have a headache, uh-huh. and, and so you may not have known at all that you were sick. Right. And for worst cases, it, it presents a lot like mono, the, the whole shebang, the body aches, the fatigue, the fever, the chills. Um, so it's got such a wide span of symptoms that they don't routinely just check for it. Mm-hmm. Um, but you said that one in three women will have CMV, mm-hmm. one in three pregnant women. One in three pregnant women. And is, is testing for it routinely something that you're advocating for in Florida? Yes. Okay. Um, we would like routine testing. It. There's some some gray area there because if we test, 
75% of the population has had CMV by the time they're 40. Wow. And so we can't pinpoint like, do you have it right now? Or is this an infection that you had maybe six months ago? Okay. Um, especially if you work with small children, women who work in daycare centers are at the highest risk because they work with small children and small children are where we get CMV. Um, it's where we get a lot of our sicknesses. We get strep throat and tonsillitis mm -hmm. and things from small children because they share a lot and um, and so women who stay at home with small children who go on play dates and hang out with other friends and women who work in daycare centers are at the highest risk yet they don't know about it and so we're just advocating that we routinely check women you know that first doctor's visit oh you, you found out you're pregnant let's see how your CMV status looks okay. and then let's talk about it throughout your pregnancy these are steps you can take to avoid getting it if you've never had it or if you've had it before here's what we can do about a, a reactivation what are um, what are some of the things that women can do to avoid getting CMV when they're pregnant it's a lot of what we're doing right now with COVID we're washing our hands we are being cautious about interaction um, with people outside of our small circles um, and so like women in daycare centers should be wearing gloves when they change diapers mm -hmm. uh, making sure not to take those baby kisses maybe straight to the face uh -huh. um, and <laughs> the slobber the, kisses. The, the slobbery <laughs> kisses as much as we just love that baby cuddle um, to just be a little more cautious about our contact with body fluids mm -hmm. um, because it's that's how it's passed um, you know we move through our lives so quickly we we wipe our nose and we move on and sometimes we just need to slow down just mm -hmm. a little bit and take those extra precautions to prevent an infection. And like you said earlier, don't put the binky in your mouth, mm -hmm. you know, just to clean it off after it falls yes. on the floor. Yeah, if it falls on the floor, put it away and hope right. you have an extra one. And okay. um, not sharing eating utensils, you know, and moms are really bad about that. They're like, I'm not gonna eat lunch because they're not gonna eat half of what's on their plate, uh -huh. so I'll just eat that later. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, and you know, that, that utensil that went into their mouth is now into your mouth. And if they have CMV at the moment, it's sharing. So when we come back, I want to talk about what happens when you pass CMV in utero to your baby mm -hmm. and, and what that meant for Hank and what Hank is like now. Sounds good. Wow. I don't know about you, but that scares me. Oh, yes. And, and, I, and I'll tell you why. It's because it's so counterintuitive. When I am around a baby, I want to get all of its sugar. Mm -hmm. I want to motorboat its little belly. <laughs> I want to snuggle it. I want to do whatever it will let me do with it. I just, I can't even imagine going, ooh, baby, keep your baby cooties. Well, last night I was sitting there with my two-year-old and he started to cough a little bit and I said to my husband, oh, I'm going to be sick in two days. You will be. Because I, I get yeah. everything from him, but I'm not going to start hugging him. Mm -mm. But I've never, I had never heard about CMV. I had, but I, I was, you know, wildly ignorant, you know, any kind of virus just scares me because it seems like it just does its own thing without regard to what our medical <laughs> professionals would like it to do. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I had never heard of that and I get the frustration because so what if you test you know if what 75% of the people by 40 have it so you're probably gonna have it so is it an active infection mm -hmm. if it is what do you do do they give antivirals I don't I don't know the answer to that of course but it seems like if you if testing isn't the answer at least the awareness piece that she's pushing because um, I, I, I would not have thought that I would have because you know when I, my kids were little I was a human garbage can mm -hmm. you know if they don't like their gummy we're here you know have this you yeah. know like t t eat this here's half my ice cream but don't throw it away I want it in two seconds yeah. you know and I was just I can't even imagine watching the germ content so that's uh, that awareness piece I think is very important I'm excited to learn more about it yeah we'll learn more uh, when we have the second half of that interview right after this I went to lunch with one of my former clients the other day, and she's doing great. She took the money from her settlement and she started her own company buying and selling vehicles, oh my God. which is really cool because she was in a car crash and then needed oh. a new vehicle, and so now she's able to help other yeah. folks out. Most of our clients, they find that one of the most frustrating things is the dealing with the vehicle. Oh, well, lo yeah. losing your car yeah. can yeah. totally disrupt your life. You can, you can lose your livelihood over it. If you can't get to work, or, or, you know, what's the worst thing with our clients is we're just trying to help them get well, but if they can't get to the, the health care that they need, you know, that's just another setback. One of the typical things about a comeback story is you take the pain and the struggles and the challenges that you've been through and you use that as the fire that kind of motivates you to do something good for other people. Yeah. And so I love that because now our client did exactly that, like literally to <laughs> the T. 
And we are back. We're going to hear Carrie Roan's second interview segment with Samantha Isaacs right now. So I'd like to know, or I'd like for you to share what CMV meant for Hank and what it, how it changed him and his life. So CMV, what that means for Hank, um, Hank will be six in May, and Hank is developmentally six months old. So he's mm -hmm. nonverbal, and he has no independent skills. Hank is quadriplegic. Um, he's considered failure to thrive. He has hearing loss and a vision impairment. Mm -hmm. um, and so everything is different. Mm -hmm. um, CMV caught early enough in pregnancy can involve the organs and so Hank has a brain malformation which is just considered brain damage um, and so his whole brain is affected which means that sorry <laughs> <that's okay. laughs> um, which means that everything is affected mm -hmm. um, speech and hearing and feeding and we're one of the lucky ones we don't have seizures but that could develop at any moment and you know, he's not tube fed but that doesn't mean that it won't ever happen mm -hmm. um, we actually we fought a hard battle to stay off of a tube, to, to not have to go through that. And we worked really hard with our nutritionist to develop a very, very specific diet to help keep him fat and happy. And mm. um, and it's it's a struggle just to, to raise a child who isn't growing up. You know, yeah. he might be getting bigger, but nothing changes. His and, body gets bigger, but his mm -hmm. mind doesn't change. Yeah. yeah. But it looks like from the pictures that you show me that he can show happiness. Yes. <laughs> Hank is, Hank loves life. Um, and I think he likes a lot of the things that maybe typical five-year-old boys like. He loves big trucks and motorcycles and he loves the beach. And um, we also are raising three girls who are typical. So we have to find that delicate balance of, of raising him, but giving them everything that they need also to right. one day be able to go out and live their lives. Right. I assume you have to do everything for Hank then. Mm -hmm. Yes, Hank has no independent skills at all. So when Hank is hungry, someone feeds him. When Hank wants to play, you have to play for him because he likes to, he's a watcher. He just wants to watch everyone do things. And so you have to play for him. Mm -hmm. um, he likes to look at books, but you have to hold the book and you have to flip the pages. And, um, and so everything is done for Hank because there's nothing he can do for himself. How do you communicate with him? I know it must kill you that you'll never hear him say, I love you. <laughs> but how, sorry, <laughs> how do you know what his needs are? You know, when you have a newborn and you learn those cries that I'm hungry, yeah. I'm tired, hold me, I'm lonely. Hank has developed those sounds. Mm -hmm. um, we call them little temper tantrums when he doesn't like what the big girls are watching on TV. <laughs> There's a yelling that's not crying. It's more of like, give me what I want. Um, and so he's developed that sort of a communication, um, yeah. just a nonverbal communication. We know by body language if he's happy or sad or scared or um, we he loves Thomas the train, but he does not like real trains. And so we we found out because we see the fear from the cues. You yeah, see his cues. He has the body language and the yeah. the cues on his face. So you're an advocate now uh, mm -hmm. in, in front of the Florida legislature, mm -hmm. right? With Allison Tant? Yes, so okay. Allison Tant and Jason Schoff. Allison has kind of watched Hank grow up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And um, I met Jason. Um, I forced my way into his office a few years ago. And um, actually, he got trapped on an elevator with me <laughs> and had no choice but to listen. So um, they have been devastated that this isn't something we talk about. Mothers don't know, you know, they have children then their children will grow up to have children and why aren't we talking about it's this? It's just a test, right? It's it's a blood test, it's all it is. And <laughs> at your first doctor's appointment when you get pregnant, you're having blood drawn anyway, right. so just tack why not that run one this there. test? Yeah. yeah. And they hand you that list that says don't do all of these things we can slide that one on there too. Like you said, don't scuba dive, don't you yeah. know, be on an airplane when you're nine months pregnant. They tell yeah. you all these things not to do, but yeah. it would be helpful if they would tell you yeah. not to let your kids shove their you know, yeah. saliva coated <laughs> fist into your mouth yeah. like they do when yeah. you're a so new you mom. Sneeze straight into your face. <laughs> right. and yes, all of that. It's, you know, a few minutes more education, you know, that the doctor may need to provide, but you know, with two previous pregnancies, I have never heard of CMV and mm -hmm. I never heard about it with Hank until we were diagnosed and um, so it's something I would have loved to hear about and I don't want to be um, I don't want the doctors to feel like it's an unnecessary worry mm -hmm. because I would rather have worried about it and maybe done something to prevent yeah. it than to live with the guilt and the after effects of it 
for all of these years to come. Is there um, something they can do if you get diagnosed with CVV, CMV when you're pregnant? Yes, if okay. you are diagnosed during pregnancy, if you got very ill or you, you knew enough about it to say, hey, I'd like to be tested for this, I think I may have come in contact. Mm -hmm. um, there are antiviral therapies available. Um, and the, the antivirals are there to stop the virus from doing any more damage than it already has. Hearing is typically the first thing that the virus takes away from an infant. Um, and so if you receive those antivirals during pregnancy, you have a very good chance of stopping all of that damage that's been done. You're, you won't have any worse hearing loss or vision impairment or organ damage um, if you can receive those early enough in an infection. Okay. And then what about testing Hank when he was born? Did they do that? Do they test CMV in infants? They don't. Not routinely. Um, there's a thing called targeted newborn testing, um, which is done in, there are several hospitals throughout the nation that, that do targeted testing. If a newborn fails their hearing test, they automatically test them for CMV. Um, and it's done three different ways. You have um, saliva and urine and then the newborn blood spot cards. Um, and so it's minimally invasive, there's mm -hmm. not a whole lot, um, but that test could make a huge impact because it's early intervention. Okay. You know, Hank was six months old by the time we found out and nearly a year old before any therapy was started. Had we found out at birth, maybe we could have been six months old starting okay. therapy. And okay. so finding out as soon as possible is the best hope we have. But it won't cure it and it won't reverse it, right? No. No. but it'll give a better outcome for the child. Yeah, early intervention is extremely important because our brain's very plastic at a young age. We can learn a lot of new mm -hmm. things. You can create new pathways in, um, if we can give a child the opportunity to do that early enough in life, they may be able to make some progress. Well, thank you for everything you're doing. I hope every single woman <laughs> watches this show and knows about it because you're right. Even, you know, I'm not going to have more kids, but my kids hopefully someday will have kids and I'll know about this. Yeah. That's our hope is pointing people to education. You know, they, there are so many avenues out there. Your OB knows about it. You just ask some questions. Mm -hmm. You can visit the National CMV Foundation and learn more. Um, there are plenty of ways to educate yourself and your family members to help them know about CMV, how to get tested, and how to be treated. Well, thank you so much for sharing it with us. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, wow. Oh, what a brave, strong woman. Oh, I know. Yeah. She is not only caring for her three girls mm -hmm. and Hank, but she's making it a priority to go out and spread the word and spread awareness. Yeah, yeah. No, she's she's a real inspiration in my view, but doesn't she remind you so much, Kimmy, of some of our personal injury clients? That guilt factor. Oh, it's just, it, it, it rips me up because especially whenever there's something that happens to a child, whether a child's injured, whether a child has a, a birth injury, an accident, whatever, those parents, what they do to themselves with that guilt is just so much. And, and here, obviously, this is nothing that this woman could have done. Now, had she been alerted to it, she might have changed her behavior. She would have asked for some screening. She probably would have been a little bit more aggressive about a uh, right off the bat, you know, neonatal screening. But Oh my goodness, I just, it breaks my heart when I see so many people like her who, you know, do, are doing everything right and then mm -hmm. they're so riddled with guilt. I just wish I could, you know, assuage that. Yeah. Well, I'm just, I'm so thankful for her getting out there and advocating and then sharing the news so we could share it here today, too, yeah. about that CMV is out there and there's just some things to be on the lookout for. Yeah, and, and what I'd like, though, is is she what really went after it. We can talk a lot uh, more about this when we come back after the break, but, um, you know, she, she wasn't satisfied with what she could do within her community. She's like, well, where are my leaders? You know, where, where are our representatives? Let me get, you know, get a hold of them, get in their ear, and let's make some things happen. So... Uh, well, I'm excited to, to wrap this up and find out a little bit more about, um, or a little, talk a little bit more about it and, and leave on a positive note with everything that she shared with us. So, so come back after the break and we'll wrap up. You know what's funny? When law firms advertise that they'll give a free consultation, every consultation we give is free, unless we can get you a settlement based on your injuries. Right. Every time you give me a call, it's free. Yeah. I yeah. want you to give me a call. Yeah. You know, we're not going to charge you unless we actually get you something for yeah, your case. That's right. mm -hmm. You don't have to pay me anything unless I win the case. Right. And on top of that, I'm going to pay for all of the court costs and the deposition costs and medical records costs and expert opinions costs. All of that's coming out of my pocket. And if we don't win the case, then we eat those costs at no charge to right. you. Right. So we don't take 
a case we don't believe in because it's not in our interest. Right. And we don't minimize or devalue your case because that's also not in our interest. Right. So it makes everything fair. If you have a lawyer on a contingency fee, you can hire the very best right. lawyer. And we are back. You know, I, I wanted to make sure people have this resource because a lot of people get to the early, the neonatal screening uh, through their um, OBGYN will give you a lot of resources as you're going through your pregnancy journey. Uh, your pediatrician uh, will give you the resources. But if you're new to town or if you don't have established uh, doctors or, or for whatever reason, please know you can call 211 from any phone and they will direct you to where your child can get these early childhood screenings because again, the, the earlier you get on top of anything, whether it's, it's the effects of, of this uh, CMV virus, whether it's um, somebody who might have a spectrum, autism spectrum disorder, mm -hmm. uh, any kind of hearing, any kind of thing like that, if you could get on it earlier and get the therapies initiated early, it makes such a difference. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, she mentioned a couple of things. She went to her representatives, and, and in this area, we've got a, such an advocate and such an ally in Allison uh, Tant. She has a, a son who's got a developmental uh, disability, and she is on the forefront. She's making sure that these children can be in mainstream where they can, that they can live independently to the extent that that is possible, and she is on the front lines. But also Jason Shove. you know, two different parties, but you know what? Who can't come together when you're talking about children? Yeah. And he's a he's a parent. He has children. And he listened to her, and so she she's not content to just you know leave it alone. So I, I appreciate the leadership of our our two representatives on that. Absolutely, absolutely. I loved how she talked about too how she's trying to uh, make allow Hank to live his best life yeah. and do what they can to engage him with the other children mm -hmm. and um, just give him all the joy that he can during his life. Yeah, and they celebrate the diagnosis day. Yeah. Because that, I mean, I, I can see that because that's when they got their answers. This is what I, I, have, a, I have an understanding now, and so let's go. If this is what we're dealing with, let's go and let's celebrate mm -hmm. your being here and let's give you the best quality life you can and integrate you fully. You know, he's, he's getting on his sister's nerves just like uh, any other little boy would, any, any young, young son in a, in a family of those female, strong female girls. So um, it's, it's just wonderful. But I, do, I don't want to leave without talking about her blog. Yes. So if you're dealing with anything like this, maybe not this exact problem, but, you know, new parents struggling, you know, you need some help. But she's got a blog, Sunshine and Shattered Dreams, and she shares her stories and the stories of other parents who have children uh, with CMV. So thank you so much for watching. Check out our QR code and check us out. If you've got a comeback stronger story, let us hear about it. Thank you for watching. We look forward to seeing you next time. And you know what the insurance company offered him? Five thousand really? dollars. He's completely, he's completely blind, and they offer him five thousand dollars. Yeah. Ask him, ask him to sign a release. To a lot of people especially when they're hurting and when they're down and when they're vulnerable. $5,000 is a life-changing amount of yeah. money. Yeah. And they're not looking at the mm -hmm. value of what has been lost. They're not looking at what it would take to, to make that person whole, which mm -hmm. is our job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's our job. Their job isn't. Their job is to save the insurance company money. Right. And they look at this person and they go, hmm. I bet $5,000 would get your full attention. Right. And they mm -hmm. come in and they dangle it yeah. with a settlement release. And then mm -hmm. once you sign it, you're done. You can't come back to us and ask us to make, wave a magic wand and make that go away. That can't go away. Mm -hmm. My client didn't accept the $5,000. We took him all the way to trial. We got a $5 million verdict. Wow. 